So um, I just want to say thank you for the invite. This is a very unusual uh, setting for me to be doing uh, this kind of presentation. Uh, as many of you know, James and I have collaborated for many years. We teach a course on psychology and Buddhism and explore those sort of the interface between those two things. Um, and so when I was uh, asked to, uh, to do this, I, I just began focusing on my research, which is a very different thing than what uh, JB and I do in, in our class. I began looking at and asking questions about um, how that might relate to Buddhism, how it might, it might relate to, uh, uh, to technology. And so what I'm going to try to do today is give you a, a little, uh, some snippets of a research program that now spans about 50 years. Uh, we've been collecting data about individuals' lives over that uh, period of time uh, and, and talk a little bit how it connects to maybe some of the topics that you all have been talking about. And at the core of this uh, uh, research is a, is a very uh, basic question. Uh, and it's captured uh, in a photo that I took, and I don't know if, uh, uh, if uh, someone knows about this, but a photo I took a, a number of years ago uh, of, of Jamie actually doing something. And, it, it, the, and the gist of the question that we're trying to ask is, what happens when your immediate desire for something, your sort of immediate craving for something, preempts uh, your sort of long-term uh, objective or goal? That is, what is the phenomena of delay of gratification, uh, and, and what are its implications uh, for us as we go across the life course? Now, as a psychologist, uh, as I think about this stuff, um, I uh, 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 think of my research as research on what we call self-control. And because we studied over the life course, we asked questions about sort of lifelong patterns of well-being. That is, how is it that self-control affects our, our well-being across the life course? And so if I were to sort of crudely translate that into questions that might have something to do with Buddhism, what we're really interested in is sort of what is one aspect of the idea of craving, uh, and how does it, in fact, come to relate to well-being and or suffering in some, in some instances. Um, so in, in my sort of perspective on this, uh, I, I see craving as very important in life. I think you have to have desires, and I think you have to pursue those desires. Uh, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is try to understand how that process works, uh, how people regulate its impact on, on their lives on an ongoing uh, and so what we're trying to do, in addition to that, and what has become the focus of our work most recently, is I attempt to identify these enduring patterns of how we interact with our environment uh, uh, in ways that either enhance or constrain uh, our general well-being. Uh, and the way that we do that uh, is through uh, something that has been popularly uh, uh, recognized and understood and named and labeled as the marshmallow test. And so I'm going to show you a very uh, brief uh, video of some children participating uh, in this test. And what I want you to do as, you, uh, as I show you this is really to focus very carefully on what the kids are doing. This is actually a, a video that was made by CNN for a presentation they did recently about the work. And it's just going to both describe the paradigm uh, and you'll get to see some kids uh, coping with the, 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 the test itself. The rules of the experiment are simple. Oh, nice Of these different kinds of treats, Oreo, marshmallow, or pretzel, which one do you like the most? You like the marshmallow the most? If you had to choose between one marshmallow or two marshmallows, which one do you want? You want two marshmallows? Okay. I have to go out of the room now to do a little bit of work. If you wait until I come back by myself and you don't eat the marshmallows, then you can have the two marshmallows. But there's one big caveat that five-year-old Victoria, who doesn't know she's being filmed, is about to learn. If you don't want to wait, you can ring this bell anytime you want to and I'll come back right away. But if you ring the bell, you can't have two marshmallows, then you can only have one marshmallow right away. Okay, I'm going to go do my work. I'll see you in a bit. The psychologist doesn't tell these preschoolers how long she'll be gone or how long they'll have to wait for their prize. In reality, it's exactly 10 minutes. Judging from their reactions, I think it was an eternity. <laughs> Same goes for Sienna. Ben tries something a little different, a serenade of sorts. Swimming. A close inspection of the key to 
early marshmallow salvation, the bell. <laughs> at Stanford University, uh, and it was administered in a, in a series of experiments that took place between about 1967 and 1972. Um, uh, there were about 30 experiments in all, about 500 kids participated in these experiments. And what they were fundamentally interested in is sort of what were the contextual uh, and the cognitive factors that influenced the kids' just ability to wait, which was to do this particular task. And I want to talk about a couple of the, the results of those experiments because they're important to the discussion of sort of what the long-term uh, findings in this research actually are. So this is actually uh, the first experiment, the results for the very first experiment they did where they did a very simple little manipulation in, in the board. What they did was they took the, uh, uh, so they took the uh, uh, experiment just the way you saw, and they manipulated one thing. And the thing that they manipulated was whether or not they left the rewards out on the table while the kids had to wait. Okay? And so in one experiment, uh, the rewards were just like you just saw it. In another condition, uh, the experimenter, when they left the room, would just take the rewards away with them. Right? And this is basically what happens when you do that. When you leave both rewards there, kids find this to be a really, really challenging thing to do. And on average, in this particular experiment, although it tends to be longer, you'll see, uh, kids were only able to wait, on average, about one minute. Right? <laughs> now, when you take that and then you change the, the context, you just take the, the rewards away, what you find is something very dramatic happens. Kids are able to wait about 11 minutes. Okay? So kids can actually wait. And this is a, you know, waiting for a four-year-old is a very challenging thing. But they're able to do it if you just change the situation. And what we found, they also found, is that if you leave one of them out there, you get this kind of intermediate effect. Right? Uh, and so one of the things, the first findings in this sort of thing is that context is very important. The way the situation is structured, what's in front of the kids, and what they're focused on, and how they're, how they're using attention, uh, seems to be very, very important. Um, and so many people look at this and they say, well, then what's happening is behavior is sort of being driven by the stimulus stimulus-bound behavior, putting the rewards in front of it makes it very difficult. And we'll see that that's partially true, but what's also true is that you can change that very simply by giving kids instructions about how to represent that situation, right? So in these studies, uh, what kids were done is the same sort of thing, but in this case, the rewards are out there for all the kids, right? But the kids are told to think about the rewards differently. So half of the kids in this study are told to think about how yummy and chewy the marshmallows are going to be. Right? And, and the other half of the kids are thought, are told to think about how marshmallows are puffy like clouds. Right? And the kids that are uh, uh, told to think about how yummy and chewy uh, the marshmallows are going to be have a hard time waiting. The kids who uh, think about the being puffy like clouds, that is to look at the more, what we call cool properties of the of things, can wait a long time. So this is sort of demonstrating that it's not just the physical presence of the, of the rewards that's in present, but it's how kids represent those rewards in their heads, they cognitively represent them, that seems to be very important. The interesting thing is, if you think about this, and one of the questions we want to ask, because remember I told you to focus on what those kids were doing when they were, when they were doing that, 
is what, what are kids spontaneously doing? And it seems like what kids are spontaneously doing when you don't give them this kind of instruction is more like thinking about how yummy and chewy they are than thinking about how they're puffy like clouds. Um, and so, so there were a lot of experiments. I don't have time to, to go through them today, but I'm just going to tell you some takeaways from those experiments. Uh, one of those subtle changes in the setting or instruction uh, can have profound effects on, on how long kids wait. Uh, behavior is highly context sensitive. Distraction seems to be an important key okay, to this whole thing. How long kids wait is uh, uh, a fundamentally uh, affected by how distracted the instructions are, uh, makes them from, from the particular thing. Uh, what those experiments all focus though, on are group differences, so mean differences in how things are, but not individual differences. But one of the things that we note in this is that even in those most challenging situations, some kids wait quite a long time. There's big individual differences in how long kids wait and, and focus on this. And so one of the questions we want to ask is, those things that kids are doing, are they just doing them, are they just emitting those behaviors, they're just kind of lucky, or is it something strategic, something kids are actually engaged in and doing deliberately to try to help them? And so when we began doing the longitudinal aspect of this, is where I came into play, we began looking at what, what happens if we go back to these kids now 10 years later and we ask, how are they doing in life? What do they look like? What's going on in their lives? And here, what we basically do is we send questionnaires out to their parents, now kids being teenagers, and we said, what do the kids look like? So these are the correlations between how long they waited in the delay situation as a four-year-old and how their parents are describing them as teenagers. And so kids that actually waited a long time, uh, you can see are being described as being fluent, able to concentrate, skillful, planful, uh, creative, resourceful, uh, and actually quite adaptive is what, what the gist of it is. On the contrast, kids that were unable to awake are described as kids who have a lot of problems. And in particular, difficulty dealing with stress seems to be a theme that comes up over and over again uh, in, these, in these sorts of situations. So these were really striking findings for us and stuff we didn't really expect. One of the really things, the interesting things about these long-term findings is they, they, seem, they seem to be pointing to a particular aspect of self-control that seems to be very important, and that's the idea of flexibility or resilience as kids move from one situation to situation. So sometimes when people talk about self-control, they talk about this notion of willpower and that the way to make yourself uh, have self-control is just to grit it out, sort of make yourself get, get through the situation. And that's actually measured in one of our measures by this impulsivity measure. Uh, and it seems to be totally unrelated to the way the kids were behaving when they were youngsters. What does seem to be powerfully related is this notion of adaptability or resilience, uh, flexibility of their behavior as they move from situation to situation. Uh, these are also parental ratings. And basically, the parents are saying that the kids who wait are more academically competent, they're more socially competent. They don't have more problems, but when they do have problems, uh, they have uh, they show better coping with those sorts of problems. Um, so one of the things that we next turn to was this notion of, well, um, you know, we have all these different kids and all these different experimental situations. Certainly, a lot of those kids, we are telling them what to do. So if we're telling them what to do, they're not relying on their own resources. So we really shouldn't be seeing this kind of long-term effects on their behavior if we're providing them with the resources for doing it. So what we did was we broke down all of the experimental situations into those that are very challenging and those that are less challenging. And we did that just by whether the rewards were present or not. And then what we did was we looked at whether or not kids were using a, a spontaneous strategy, that is they weren't told what to do, or whether or not they were using the suggested strategy the experimenters provided them with an idea about what to do. Okay. And uh, then what we did was basically look at the same kinds of relationships. Are there longitudinal relations to how kids behave in these different kinds of experimental situations? And lo and behold, basically what you find is that you only find the longitudinal relations in situations where, first of all, it's a challenging situation. 
So if it's an easy situation, you don't find meaningful individual differences. Uh, and when kids are left to their own sort of spontaneous coping strategies to deal with that. So what you see here is all of the sort of important relations are coming out of this one column. It is in the what we call the diagnostic sort of condition. Uh, this uh, 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 is also shown, and, and one of the things that has got a lot of uh, attention in our work is that this behavior, this sort of uh, a delay of gratification behavior, also predicts things like scholastic aptitude scores. It's a preparatory test for, for getting into college. Uh, but it only does it in these sort of situations that are challenging and the rewards or uh, the strategies are uh, left to the kids on the So what the, the gist of this, and what, what I'm going to leave you with, since I'm running out of time, uh, uh, is is very simply that that uh, those things that you saw those kids doing in uh, in the research, uh, uh, those little cute things that you know we think are funny, are actually the kids' coping strategies. Uh, they're deliberate. They had and they're connected to uh, uh, to to what's going on with these kids later on in life. In our own research program, we now these what you've seen here is just a peep of what's happening in adolescence. Uh, but we've studied these people now into their 40s and 50s, and we're in the process now, and I don't have time to share with you, of, sort of looking at the neuroscience of what's going on inside their brain uh, in terms of these sort of patterns of self-control over the life of